Thank you all for inviting me to give this presentation. I appreciate that opportunity, and I hope that what I have to say is of some interest, especially to the students in the audience. What I want to do is break this talk down into a couple of components. There is a bit of complaining and grievance uh, at the first part, and then uh, the biological material at the end. The complaints and grievances are a consequence of some editing and review work that I've done over the last few years. I feel obligated to try and uh, set the record straight just a little bit. Uh, so let's begin with uh, some of the statistical considerations my complaints, and I'd like to begin with Karl Popper. He is known as the enemy of certainty. His major philosophical work uh, is essentially a treatise on conjecture and refutation. People talk about scientific proof. Uh, there is no scientific proof that in science we're not trying to prove anything. We can't prove anything because we don't have a good handle on what reality is. We are limited by our sensory systems. Our sensory sense systems give us incomplete information, uh, and therefore it is impossible to know what, what the truth is. Uh, and because we don't know what the truth is, we can't uh, perform a proof. Now, in mathematics, proofs are possible all the time, uh, and that's because mathematics involves no reality. Mathematics is, is simply factual information. Uh, so uh, we have these ideas, we establish them as facts, and we can then set about proving those arguments or whatever. That's not possible in science. What we do in science is we have a conjecture and then we work very hard at refuting that conjecture, not trying to show that it's correct, but instead trying to show that it's wrong. Uh, that is an important distinction. Um, the next uh, point I'd like to make uh, concerns Bayesian issues. Uh, we do live in a Bayesian world. When you have knowledge of a system, the probabilities change. The probabilities in the statistical table don't change, but the probabilities themselves are changing. Uh, the more information or the more knowledge you have about the system, the true probabilities of particular outcomes are going to be different. Importantly, when we conduct scientific experiments in biology, we generally use an alpha value of 0.05. Uh, and what that means is the probability of making a right decision is 95%, and the probability of making a wrong decision is 5%. That seems like it should be intuitively obvious, but it's not. Under these conditions, if you have 100 pairwise comparisons, by chance alone, you expect five of them to be significant. What one has to do in those circumstances is develop some sort of Bayesian correction. And usually the, the easiest way to do that, and also the most conservative way to do that, uh, is by using a Bonferrani adjustment. Um, the next uh, important uh, point that I want to make concerns uh, how we approach what we do. Um, and it is exceedingly important, I think, to have a very specific question. Uh, you have to know what it is you are uh, trying to do. Now, we don't all do studies that are at least initially hypothesis-driven. There's a lot of value in doing descriptive studies and observational studies. Uh, oftentimes, before you can even begin to know what the appropriate questions are, you have to spend a lot of time just observing the system or describing the system. But ultimately, a formal question is going to help you focus your efforts and also focus your thinking. Now, in addition to that, uh, when we're thinking about those questions, and those ultimately lead to our hypotheses, uh, it is important to understand the difference between proximate and ultimate questions. Uh, proximate questions are one in which we're asking, how does this thing work? Or, or how does the blood manage to circulate to all parts of the body? Something along those lines. The ultimate question is a why question. So proximate questions are how, ultimate questions are why. Uh, so why does an organism perform this behavior versus how does the organism perform the behavior? The next point I want to make concerns how many observations are sufficient. But from a statistical point of view, the thing to keep in mind is that if your data are normally distributed, then you need 30 observations for each parameter that needs to be estimated. Where does that number 30 come from? If you look at a table for the normal distribution and compare it with the table for a student's t-distribution, 
you'll notice that when you have 60 observations, those two tables are almost indistinguishable from one another. At 30 observations, they are very, very, very close. If you have fewer than 30, then that whole, that similarity begins to break down a little bit. But as long as you have 30 observations and you know the data are normally distributed, you're fine. If you are absolutely certain that the data are normally distributed, then if the data are well behaved, you can get away with 10 observations for each parameter that needs to be estimated. So for example, if you're doing a regression analysis, you're regressing weight as a function of height, then you need at a bare minimum 10 observations if you know that those data are well behaved and normally distributed. If the data are not normal, then you have a couple of strategies that you can employ. One is to use some sort of data transformation. So spend some time, look at what the distribution looks like. You can do that with box plots or histograms or whatever. Get a feel for what the distribution of the data is like and then decide what data transformation is best. Now, oftentimes, uh, you know certainly that your data are not normally distributed. For example, if you're working with binomial data, so percentage data, uh, if the data are just percentage data, then you can use an arc sine transformation, which is pretty standard. Um, but if your data are binomial in the sense that they are just zeros and ones, you can then rely on the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem says that the average of a distribution is going to be normally distributed. Um, so you can employ that particular strategy. So you can add observations together and work with means or averages rather than the raw data and then employ the statistical test that you had intended. If all of that fails, you can always rely on a non-parametric test. Very quickly then, I would like to make one other point, and that is that a principal components analysis is not the same as a canonical variance analysis. More on PCA in a little bit. Pay attention to the central limit theorem. Understand that means of distributions are normally distributed. So all of that leads us to this idea that it's important to really understand the system that you're working with. All right, let's move on then very quickly to biological essentials. And I'd like to talk here a little bit about shape and size. The argument was that the first axis on a principal components analysis always gave you information about size and everything after that was shape. And I'd just like to explain very briefly what principal components analysis is doing. Let's use a very simple example with only two variables, namely height and weight. Now we know that weight depends on height and height does not depend on weight. So what we'd like to do in a principal components analysis is pretty basic. The way we're just going to do an ordination of the data points. So the first step in a principal components analysis is to simply shift the axes. So here instead of having height and weight, the origin at the zero, uh, we're going to move the origin of this graph system to the average height and average weight. So that's all. We're, none of the points themselves have moved. They are all exactly where they were before. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to rotate the axes. So now we have these two new axes, PC1 and PC2. These axes are derived from the characteristic equation. Uh, what we've done is we've extracted two eigenvectors, PC1 and PC2. And you see that all that's happened is we've now taken this XY coordinate system and rotated it in such a way that most of the variation in the data occurs along PC1 and a lesser amount occurs along PC2. Now, one important feature of this new coordinate system is that these two axes are orthogonal. That is, they are statistically independent. And what that means is that now, because we have the statistical independence, we can perform statistical tests with the coordinates along PC1 and then repeat those tests with coordinates along PC2 and not have to do any kind of Bayesian correction. So here, if we look at this system, look at this point on the right-hand side there. It specifies a certain height and a certain weight. It also specifies a score along PC1 and a score along PC2. The other important thing is we can use this as a data reduction technique. So here now, instead of talking about both height and weight of our subjects, 
we can just talk about their scores along PC1 and capture most of the information. Uh, here is an example. This is for a data set that I'm going to be talking about a little bit later. These are for diets in some foxes, and the dietary items range from small mammals all the way down to mollusks. And there were 16 dietary components, so we do this principal components analysis. Each PC is a different eigenvector. The numbers that you see in those columns, those you can think of those as the correlations between the raw data and that particular axis. And at the very bottom, you see the eigenvalue. Each eigenvector has associated with it. So there you see principal component one explains 24.5% of the variation in the data. By the time you get to PC7, you're explaining 90% of the variation in the dietary data. So here's an example where you can take this data set and cut it down from 16 variables down to simply seven and still retain 90% of the information. Now, the next thing uh, that we need to think about is how do you know which of these variables is going to be uh, meaningful and what we need to ignore? We had mentioned that oftentimes the first axis is size, the, everything else is shape. How do we know that? Uh, we use this relationship illustrated here, one over the square root of n, where n is the number of uh, variables. We have 16 uh, variables here. The square root of 16 is 4. 1 divided by 4 is 0.25. So any loadings here, any of these numbers in these columns that are between minus 0.25 and 0.25, are essentially going to be isometric. Anything more extreme than 0.25 is going to be allometric. So here we see for PC1, the allometric variables that really stick out are going to be fish, uh, carrion, and large mammal carrion. But here it's clear that the first axis is not size. If the first axis was size, which makes no sense in this context, but if it were in another kind of PCA, then you would expect all of those correlations there to be roughly the same size, and they are not. All right, the next uh, point that I want to make concerns the term adaptation. Uh, we oftentimes talk about adaptations to this or adaptations to that. In order to understand if something truly is an adaptation, we need to use the comparative method. Uh, so we have to put it in a phylogenetic context. And as an example, let's talk about uh, gray foxes. All the other foxes are um, strictly terrestrial. So if you think about it, you say, well, this, certainly this animal has adaptations to arboreality. And you can begin this nice study of all of these other foxes trying to figure out what it is different about this animal that enables it to be arboreal. Well, if you look at the phylogeny for um, the foxes that we've used in our work, uh, that's illustrated here on the left. Notice where Eurocyon is located. Eurocyon is at the bottom of this, of this phylogeny. So the gray fox and the island fox form this nice little cluster. And notice that they are essentially the outgroup for all of these other foxes and canids. Notice where the coyotes are, and of course the coyotes and the wolves are going to be on that particular group. So right away you understand that island foxes and gray foxes are not really in with all of the other foxes. They are sort of this basal clade right, of canids that has given rise to all of the other foxes. So if you're trying to make the statement that something that's going in on in terms of adaptation with these with these gray foxes for arboreality, um, you're going to have to use something other than just other foxes and canids. You're going to have to use some other kind of outgroup to make that um, determination. Now, it turns out that there are other animals which are basal to this group, things like raccoon dogs, which are also arboreal. Um, but if, if raccoon dogs are arboreal, and are on a group that gives rise to the gray foxes, then the gray foxes haven't evolved that adaptation. That adaptation was already there, okay? All right, so that's an important distinction. Um, before you can claim that something is an, uh, an adaptation, you have to use the comparative method um, 
All right, so uh, finally, what matters? Uh, when we do biology, what matters? What's the most important thing uh, that I try to get across to my students? Uh, and that's pretty basic. If you want to understand uh, why that organism is the way it is, you have to understand this particular concept. It's calories in and babies out. If you look at all organisms and think about this food and sex idea about calories in, babies out, you'll go a long way towards really understanding your system. What I would like to do now is uh, talk about my first example, uh, and that involves the evolution of locomotor mode in gliding mammals. Um, gliding mammals are, I think, charismatic, uh, as exemplified here by uh, Glaucomis sobrinus in our lab. Uh, gliding locomotion is not uh, an uncommon evolutionary event within the mammals. Amongst the marsupials, there are um, at least two families that have gliders. These are the families Petardae and Buramiidae. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, you see examples of petards. Um, and these are everything from the giant Choinobates, um, so big giant pederista-like animals, size of house cats that are gliding, all the way down to things like uh, the sugar glider that you can get in a pet store, uh, about the size of a southern flying squirrel. Um, within the genus Petaris, uh, that includes the sugar glider, there is a range of sizes that encompasses not only our southern flying squirrels here in North America, uh, but also the northern flying squirrel, and then larger than that as well. So there's this nice size range within the marsupials of gliding forms. Uh, in addition to that, amongst those gliding forms in Australia, there are several forms that um, that are not gliders, but are within the gliding families. Uh, so that would include Gymnobolidius and um, Hemibolidius. Uh, both of those forms have just sort of rudimentary kind of patagia, um, but they are still within the glider family, so there's a nice natural experiment. Uh, there is another marsupial glider, and that's uh, Acrobates, the feather tail glider, uh, which is in the family Buramiidae. Um, and Acrobates is this tiny little animal somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 grams. Uh, it's called a feather tail glider because its tail is shaped like a feather. Um, and it has a uh, other members within that family that are not gliders. So there again is this nice natural experiment. Uh, in, in the Philippines, there are the Dermopterans. Uh, that's what you see on the upper right there, also known as Kalugos. Um, these guys are about the size of house cats and amongst gliding mammals, they have the most extensive patagia of, of all. In Africa, uh, there is a family, the Anomaluridae, which includes um, really uh, three forms. Uh, there are the tiny little guys. Uh, these are the African scaly-tailed flying squirrels. Um, they break down into these uh, Idiurus that has two species, Idiurus uh, zancari and Idiurus macrotus. Uh, they are in about the 10 gram uh, size range, and you see one illustrated here in the lower right. Uh, then there are four species of larger forms uh, that get up to about a kilo or so. Uh, that's the genus Anomalurus. Uh, and then there is a, a third genus, uh, Zancarella, uh, which is a non-gliding form, uh, and that we now understand is ancestral to uh, the other forms, or at least the morphology is ancestral. So it's a non-gliding form, and that non-gliding form then uh, gave rise both to the uh, the large gliders and the small gliders within the Anomaluridae. Uh, so that also is this nice natural kind of experiment. And that then raises the question, why do mammals glide uh, to begin with? Uh, and it's pretty easy to come up with these four hypotheses. Uh, and these are hypotheses that, uh, the first two at least, are the, the ideas that you see expressed in the, common, in the, in the popular literature. Um, that is, that gliding reduces the cost of transport. Uh, I will say that there have been precious few studies studying the cost of transport in gliding mammals. Um, so that assertion is usually made without any real evidence. Uh, it's also oftentimes stated that gliding reduces the risk of predation. Uh, the other possible abilities are um, that gliding uh, enables the animals to be optimal foragers. Uh, and finally, that gliding uh, makes it possible to control the forces of impact uh, when landing. So uh, let's go over these hypotheses just very quickly. 
The first hypothesis uh, comes from this uh, a paper by Keith Scholey back I'm I, late 60s, early 1970s. Uh, Keith Scholey was working in India, and uh, his major professor was Penny Kuick, who was a big avian um, metabolism guy. Um, and what Keith Scholey did was he filmed uh, Indian giant flying squirrels as they were gliding across a valley. Uh, he did not have large sample sizes. He only had uh, 12 events that he was able to film, and then he would an analyze the film. Uh, and with the help of Penny Kuick, he developed this nice little mathematical model, which enabled him to uh, compare the cost of gliding against the cost of quadrupedal transport. And in the graph that you see here on the left, uh, that dashed line is the cost of quadrupedal transport. Uh, so as you're walking, the cost doesn't change. Obviously, you're accumulating calories that are being spent, um, but the cost stays relatively constant. Um, and then the curved lines uh, represents the cost of gliding. Now, gliding itself is relatively inexpensive. We estimate that it's only going to be about twice what your basal metabolic rate is. Um, but the real cost of gliding is going to be climbing up to the launch point. And that's why these curves are going uh, sloping down like that. There are two curves there, one for uh, climbing efficiency of 20% and the other for a climbing efficiency of 40%. And you can see that if the animal has a climbing efficiency of 40%, uh, that that curve crosses the dashed line at about 45 meters, which tells you that the animals realize an energetic benefit from gliding uh, after they've glided about 45 meters. So if they're gliding 45 meters and farther, it's actually cheaper to glide than it is to move quadrupedally. Now, if they're more efficient when they climb, then that distance is going to be shorter. And if they're less efficient, it's going to be considerably greater. So Jim Robbins and I looked at uh, those mathematical models that Keith Scully was using, and we almost immediately discovered an error. Uh, we fixed that error and then re-ran his analyses, and that produced the graph that you see there on the right. And the first thing you notice is that regardless of how efficient the animal is at climbing, and that curve never drops below the horizontal line. In other words, no matter how far these guys glide, they're not going to realize an energetic benefit from gliding. Even if Keith Scully is correct, and we're wrong in terms of our, our assessment of his mathematical error, there is another problem, and that is that evidence was provided by Ando and Shirashi in Japan working on the Japanese giant flying squirrel, they measured the average glide distance for pederasta in Japan. And what they discovered was the average glide distance is only 17 meters. Well, 17 meters is far short of 45 meters. And this is a species that has the same, roughly the same size and so on. Uh, so it seems unlikely pederasta is going to realize any kind of an energetic benefit from, uh, from gliding. Uh, well, that led us to develop our own model of uh, gliding. And what we did is looked at the cost-effective glide distance. How far do you have to glide in order to realize a benefit? Uh, and we did this by looking at uh, the velocity of climbing, the velocity of gliding, the velocity of uh, launching, and so on the velocity of running, and we also uh, looked at power, and power is the rate at which work is done. So using some very basic metabolic models, we were able to estimate what the power of climbing, gliding, and running, and launching would be. Uh, and we used a host of different uh, sort of mathematical approaches, estimating uh, launch trajectories and you know using the ballistics equations and things of that sort. And then we, in addition to that, we figured out what the glide trajectories actually looked like. So we did a, a reduced major axis regression, uh, looking at the intercept, which is the, the height of the takeoff, and then the slope of the glide, so the, the glide angle, that gives us beta 1. And using this, we were then able to estimate for any particular species with these sort of basic inputs, metabolic rate and climbing and running rates and all of that sort of stuff, what the cost-effective glide distance would be. And we made those estimates for 
sugar gliders, for southern flying squirrels, for northern flying squirrels, tychozoan, which is a, a gliding gecko. We've done it for all sorts of different species. And the thing that results from all of that is in almost no case does an animal realize an energetic benefit from gliding. It's almost always cheaper to move quadrupedally than it is to glide. And that's simply because the cost of climbing is so high. So I have some suspicions about the veracity of the cost of transport hypothesis. The next hypothesis is this idea that gliding reduces predation risk. Um, and if you look at the image on the right, there's a sugar glider, which is taking off. Um, there are really two ways that you can escape predation. Uh, one is to put as much distance between you and the predator as possible, that is to maximize ballistic range. And the other approach would be to take off with maximum velocity. Uh, so take off, accelerate as rapidly as you possibly can to get away from the predator. Neither of those turn out to be the case. When we look at all of these gliding trajectories for all the species that we've looked at, in no case does the animal take off in a way that is going to maximize the ballistic range. Uh, also, when they take off, they're not maximizing their, um, their acceleration when they take off. Uh, so neither of those sorts of scenarios indicate that, that these gliding animals are trying to escape predation when they're breaking into a glide. Now, that's clearly only a subset of all of their behaviors. They may be doing something else, um, but at least the initiation of the glide doesn't seem to be related to uh, predator avoidance. When you take that information in conjunction with uh, a couple of key points, uh, one that, for northern flying squirrels at least, a single pair of spotted owls consumes 500 northern flying squirrels in a year, and that's based on work by Andrew Carey. So, boy, if gliding is if gliding helps you avoid predation, then at least northern flying squirrels are not doing a very good job of it. The other thing to remember, the second point, is that uh, who are the key predators for most of these gliding animals? Well, for southern flying squirrels, the key predators are going to be things like black rat snakes, and a black rat snake is active during the day, sticks its head in the den cavity, and once the head of the snake is in the den cavity, the only way of escape for the southern flying squirrel is through the cloaca of the snake. So there again, gliding has done nothing to uh, minimize the, the risk of predation. So it, it seems unlikely that uh, that, that is uh, the case. Now, the next part of this puzzle that we're looking at uh, involves this uh, image on the left. And this is one of the ways that we were able to estimate what, um, what sort of the energetics of launching was all about, uh, not only in relation to, to um, predation risk, right, escaping predation, uh, but also in terms of the overall energetics of gliding. Uh, and what we did here is we had an instrumented branch that is a, a, a metal branch, an aluminum branch wrapped in rope that the animals would launch from. And at the base, there were a series of strain gauges which measured deformation of the branch. And those strain gauges feed into a computer and we are then able to read how much force is being applied to that branch. If you look at this uh, graph, you'll see at point A, the animal is placed on the branch, so you get this deformation. The animal walks out to the end of the branch. At point B, the animal begins his takeoff, so his head is bobbing from side to side, and then he jumps. And at point C, you see all that force being imparted to this branch. And then D, the branch is vibrating and oscillating back down to um, stasis again. So that point C, enables you to measure what the takeoff force is. And of course, you can do the same thing for the other end when the animal lands. The next um, point uh, that I want to make is this idea of optimal foraging. Uh, and we've looked at this in a number of ways. We've set up lots of feeding experiments in the lab uh, where we use the idea of giving up densities to assess how these animals are feeding. Um, we've been out in the Black Hills of South Dakota setting up feeding trays with a variety of different food items and food concentrations and so on. Um, and the preliminary results, at least, seem to suggest that animals are following the marginal value theorem when they're visiting these trays, both in the lab uh, and out in nature. Um, and the marginal value theorem uh, is illustrated here on the left. 
and it simply says that how much time you spend in a foraging patch should be a function of two things, namely uh, the travel time it takes to get to the foraging patch, and then the second item is the rate of return in that foraging patch. Well, we have no control in nature on the travel time between patches, um, but we can control uh, what the rate of return in the patch is, and all of our results to this point indicate that uh, they are following that um, marginal value theorem in the way they forge. Now, there is one important point that I would like to make about all gliding mammals, and that is um, all gliding mammals tend to have home ranges that are significantly larger than the home ranges of similar sized mammals that they are closely related to. Um, so a flying squirrel, for example, uh, has a home range which is significantly larger than the, than the home range of something like a chipmunk. In addition to that, that all gliding mammals have a diet which involves patchily distributed food resources. So flying squirrels, southern flying squirrels take acorns. Acorns are not uniformly distributed throughout the forest. They have a food item which is patchily distributed. And what we think is that the flying squirrels, by being able to cover long distances relatively rapidly via gliding, they're able to treat this patchily distributed food resource in a fine-grained fashion. So they have a coarse-grained environment and they're able, by virtue of gliding, able to treat it in a fine-grained fashion. If you look at the Kalugos, uh, Kalugos consume only certain kinds of emergent leaf buds on certain species of trees. Uh, the same is true for sugar gliders. Sugar gliders are feeding only on gum trees, on eucalyptus trees. So all of these animals have patchily distributed food resources, and we think that what's going on is that by virtue of gliding, they're able to cover large distances relatively quickly. So it's all about forging velocity rather than predator avoidance or something of that sort. The next idea is this notion that gliding enables you to uh, reduce the force of impact. And I think that's illustrated very nicely here in this graph. Uh, this is velocity profile uh, for three flying squirrels in the lab, uh, covering a relatively short distance, time on the x-axis and velocity on the, on the y-axis. Um, and what you can see in section A here is that the animals are accelerating uh, pretty rapidly as they're taking off. Uh, so once they leave uh, the branch, they continue to accelerate, and they then reach this period of semi-stasis. Uh, the velocity is still increasing a little bit as a consequence of gravity, but it's no longer that rapid acceleration. And then you can see in section C there, they decelerate pretty quickly. Uh, and the deceleration is actually more rapid than the acceleration. So they're really putting the brakes on. And you can see that here in the image on the left. Um, this is a northern flying squirrel landing on a tree trunk in the lab. Uh, and the patagia are flared out, the front legs are extended, ready to make contact with the branch, and then uh, the animal is going to slow down as it hits that, that tree trunk. Some of the energy is going to be absorbed by the front appendages, and then the back appendages are going to hit. So the animal really is reducing uh, the energy of impact. Landing is a significant event. There's a lot of force that's imparted to that, uh, to that branch. When these guys are taking off, uh, they're accelerating with about 8 Gs, which is pretty significant. Uh, when they're landing, uh, they're coming in something close to that. So those forces are, are not trivial. Um, and we think that one of the things that might be going on uh, is that if you're able to control the landing, uh, you can then climb up and do other sorts of things. If you're not able to control the landing and you fall to the ground, right, then you are clearly at a disadvantage. On the right-hand side there, you can see the same sort of thing in a southern flying squirrel uh, taken just shortly after the animal has taken off. This is for a, a very short glide. Initially, the animal is in still as takeoff mode, right? And you can see by the third image there on the left that the animal has already initiated this braking posture. Now I would like to talk a little bit about the evolution of uh, locomotor mode and foraging in foxes. This is part of a study that uh, I did with Lacey Dolan basically began as a question about the gray fox. Um, the gray fox, 
as you probably know, is semi-arboreal. And in discussions with George Feldhammer, um, he felt that it would be worthwhile looking at the morphology of the gray fox, and uh, particularly in, in terms of locomotion. Um, and our interest at that time was focused on the pelvic girdle and on the scapula, uh, trying to understand how it is that gray foxes are able to become arboreal or semi-arboreal. And uh, we were initially doing a comparison between gray foxes and red foxes, and uh, it didn't take very long at all before we realized that that was uh, an insufficient approach. Uh, so what we've done is looked at um, as many foxes as we were able to, uh, including South American foxes and bush dogs and uh, crab eating foxes and island foxes and so on. So uh, our sample has grown rather dramatically. And there are some other problems that uh, confront us as well. Uh, one of the things uh, about foxes is that uh, their phylogenetic history um, is sort of curious um, and makes any sort of comparisons uh, in a phylogenetic context difficult. The other issue is that foxes are really pretty good, regardless of what their morphologies might indicate. And here you see, this is a red fox in the Tetons coming down this snowy slope, got himself an early uh, yellow-bellied marmot. So you wouldn't normally think of a fox as being able to take a yellow-bellied marmot, but um, this one clearly did. What we're doing now is asking the question, is there some sort of relationship between the morphology of these animals uh, and their diets and their locomotor modes? So we're going to try and use morphology uh, and a little bit of diet information in order to tease that out and determine if we can recognize some kind of signal, some sort of evidence for adaptation in the gray foxes that indicates that they are specialized for their mode of locomotion and or their diet. The way we've done this is, first of all, by for all the foxes in our sample, we obtain dietary information. Uh, and this is pretty crude dietary information, so it's just presence absence data. And what we do then, once we have that matrix of food items uh, of zeros and ones, uh, we do a principal components analysis of the diet. Uh, and you might say right away, well, that doesn't seem quite right because zeros and ones are not going to be normally distributed. Uh, and that is true. Uh, however, uh, when we're looking at uh, these binomial variates, and they are binomially distributed, uh, the sum of just six binomial variates uh, is almost indistinguishable from the normal distribution. Uh, so we can rely on the central limit theorem to help us um, escape that little problem. And it turns out ultimately that it works reasonably well and the deviation from normality isn't sufficient to really create a problem. And recall too that a principal components analysis is not a statistical test. Uh, it is simply an ordination routine. What we then do is we perform uh, a thin plate spline of each fox jaw. Uh, so we perform a thin plate splines analysis of the jaws, use those coordinates then to extract information about shape, uh, and then do a canonical variance analysis of the shapes, and then follow that up with a non-parametric version of principal components analysis called non-metric multidimensional scaling. And we're going to correlate those scores uh, with their diets. And I'll show you what that looks like here in just a few moments. Um, but as I noted before, uh, gray foxes are um, arboreal. Uh, this is a gray fox. Uh, this is a gray fox up in a, up in a tree. And on the left, you see a phylogenetic tree for uh, all of the foxes that we've used in our, um, in our analysis. And the thing I'd like to point out is the position of the gray fox in this phylogeny. So you notice at the very bottom, uh, island foxes and gray foxes, both in the genus Eurocyon, um, are sister species, and they are sort of an outgroup for all of the other foxes. The true foxes, those uh, animals in the genus Vulpes, are uh, at the top of the diagram. There you see Vulpes lagopus. Uh, now it would be Alopex lagopus. Rupel's fox, the red fox, the Bengal fox, and then the Tibetan fox. Those are all up there at the top. Notice the position of the coyote. So the coyote and all of the other dog are going to be right there in the middle of that. So you realize right away that the gray foxes are sort of this basal clade. So they are not within the midst of this. 
And in terms of trying to understand adaptation, it's going to be almost impossible because if we find any real morphological attributes within the island foxes or gray foxes, and we want to say that those are adaptations, we really can't demonstrate that with this kind of a phylogeny because they are, in some sense, the outgroup. They are the basic model from which everything else has evolved. And that provides us with a rather significant problem, um, but let's go ahead and take a look at what this uh, looks like anyway. Uh, so here is a red fox jaw. These red dots that you see on there, uh, those are the landmarks that we used in this analysis. And the landmarks, and we also have these semi-landmarks uh, from the mandibular condyle around the angular process. And then along the bottom of the ramus of the dentary bone, right there to the bottom of the carnassial tooth. Um, overall, it gives us a good sense of what the shape of these uh, dentaries is going to look like. Let's go back now and look at the dietary information and the diet categories that we're using are uh, listed here on the left hand side. And remember all of these are recorded as zeros and ones. And there on the right hand side you see uh, the eigenvectors um, and the eigenvalues. And we can see what the percentage variance explained by each eigenvector is. Uh, so that by the time we get to the seventh eigenvector we've covered 90% of the dietary variance that's uh, within our sample. Values in bold, those are the, um, the factor loadings or the eigenvalue loadings that are uh, non-isometric. Uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier, so those are the ones that we should pay attention to. So you can see that uh, the first principal component, PC1, uh, is comprised primarily of uh, things like fish and carrion and large mammal carrion um, and so on. That's how we have our dietary scores. Uh, once we've obtained all of our XY coordinates for the landmarks, uh, we perform a Procrustes uh, superimposition. So we take all of the coordinates for each specimen and we try to align them uh, so that we're going to scale them all to the same sort of size and the same orientation. And in doing that, everything that we look at from that point on is going to be an assessment of, of shape rather than size. This analysis, this Procrusty superimposition, makes it possible for us now to just simply analyze the shape. And once we have these newly fitted coordinates, uh, we can then do a series of analyses, and we can do a kind of a principal components analysis of these. Uh, and what that involves is what's referred to as a relative warp analysis. Um, the, the mathematics is quite complex, but essentially all we're doing is looking at deformations. Uh, how do we have to change one shape to make it match a different shape? And the amount of deformation that's required to do that is referred to as a bending energy. And we can take this matrix of bending energies and perform a principal components analysis on that or a canonical variance analysis. And that then gives us the, the diagram that we see here on the right hand side. So let's look at this diagram. Uh, this is a canonical variance analysis of the um, different shapes in these jaws. So this is a statistical test and we are asking the question, how are these jaws different? And what you'll notice is that uh, you can see there are these nice tight little groups. These are 95% uh, confidence intervals for these groups. Um, if you look on the lower right hand side of that graph, you'll see these black and gray circles. Those are the island and gray foxes. So the black circles are the gray foxes, uh, the gray circles are the island foxes, so those are both in the genus Eurocyon. Immediately above those, those are the crab-eating foxes. And at the very top, uh, that's Speothus, um, those are the bush dogs. So bush dogs uh, are within the fox clade, um, but they clearly don't look at all like foxes, and they're morphologically, obviously, they're not very much like foxes either. Uh, the red circles close to the origin, um, those are the red foxes. So the first thing you notice is how different red and gray foxes are, right? And how bo different both red and gray foxes are from uh, the bush dogs. 
Now, if you look at these wireframe diagrams on the left, the one at the top uh, illustrates the variation in shape that you see along canonical variant two. And the one below that is the shape variation that you see along canonical variant one. Now, there are two things going on, right? Uh, if you look at those wireframe diagrams, you'll notice that um, there is a dark blue line and then there is sort of a turquoise line. The turquoise line represents the portion at low ends of the canonical variant. So for canonical variant one, the illustration on the bottom, uh, that's going to the turquoise one is going to represent what's going on with the red foxes. The dark blue one represents the high values of canonical variant one. So that's going to be what's going on with the gray foxes. And looking at that, you can see that there are some subtle differences in the shapes of the jaws of red and gray foxes. Uh, what you'll notice is that gray foxes and island foxes tend to have a dentary bone that is somewhat shorter than that of the red fox. You'll also notice the difference, uh, very subtle differences in the shape of the coronoid process. Um, and importantly, what's going on around the angular process. And as you know, the gray foxes have that kind of heel-like structure at the base of the, of the dentary bone that isn't apparent in uh, the red fox. All right, looking at canonical variant two, um, that dark blue line is going to represent what's going on uh, with the bush dogs. And you'll notice how robust that the horizontal ramus of the dentary is. So these are animals that have a very different kind of diet from other sorts of foxes. And that dentary bone accommodates that by being very robust, particularly right there around the um, carnassial tooth. So when we look at uh, all of these things, what we can do is we can take these scores from this canonical variance analysis and use those scores as our, as our shape information and then correlate in some way uh, the relationship between that and diet. And the way we've done that is we've extracted these, these scores from the canonical variance analysis and then performed a non-metric multidimensional scaling of those scores. And that gives, this, gives us this nice ordination that you see here. So there are two things going on here. Uh, you can see these uh, black dots with the labels indicating all of the different species of foxes. That's our ordination of the of all the different jaws. And then you see these green vectors. Uh, those are the biplots for the dietary items on this ordination. So we have what essentially what we're doing is we're looking at the relationship between shape and diet. And each of these vectors represents the correlation between that particular diet based on the principal components analysis and the shape that you see here. So notice uh, one interesting component here, and I've circled those in red. If you'll notice, uh, both Eurocyan uh, literalis and uh, Eurocyan scenario argenteus, uh, those are the circles up towards the top of this um, ordination. Those are our gray and island foxes. The red fox is towards the lower right-hand uh, part of the graph, and that's circled. Notice how different they are in this space. Notice too the diet vectors that are associated with them. So the gray foxes are most strongly correlated with diet 13 and diet 14. The red foxes are most strongly correlated with diet number one and diet number 12 and then diet number six, okay? So we know that these animals are differing in terms of their dietary um, component. And we also know that they differ in terms of their morphology. All right, uh, next I'd like to talk uh, a little bit about what's going on with polar bears. Uh, and here our interest is uh, primarily in the evolutionary fate of polar bears. And as you know, as a consequence of climate change, that the polar bears are threatened by loss of habitat. Polar bears are also unique uh, in terms of their diet. Unlike grizzly bears, which are pretty omnivorous. 70% of the diet of a polar bear is going to be fat. So they're concentrating on seals and they, uh, they take in an enormous amount of fat. Ultimately, the question is if natural selection is operating on polar bears and they are losing this ice habitat, is it going to be possible for them to, as a consequence of natural selection, uh, become more like grizzly bears? Um, are they going to be able to exploit a more grizzly bear kind of a diet or are they 
totally trapped in their in the current model that they have. Uh, and the way we did this was by looking at jaws for uh, polar bears, black bears, and grizzly bears, our, our three North American bears. We're interested in the shapes of these jaws, and these jaws are going to give us information about various mechanical properties. Uh, so it's not just the shape, but it's also the mechanical advantage that the, the animal is capable of. Uh, and in the diagram that you see at the upper uh, left here, I've drawn in some vectors. Uh, this is a dentary bone from Acrobates, which is the feather tail glider from Australia. Uh, and you see I have a, a red line, a yellow line, and a white line illustrated there. The red line represents the load arm. So if we're thinking in terms of vectors or mechanical lever sorts of systems, uh, the red line is, represents the load arm, at least for that lower incisor. Um, then there are two other vectors. The yellow vector represents the effort arm uh, for the masseter muscle. The masseter muscle is going to have its point of uh, insertion inside that masseteric fossa. Uh, so when the masseter muscle pulls on that dentary bone, right, that is that yellow part there is basically the effort arm that it is using. The temporalis muscle goes to the top of the coronoid process, so there the effort arm for the temporalis muscle is going to be that white vector that goes from the mandibular condyle up to the top of the coronoid process. So if we want to know what the mechanical advantage of a particular muscle is, uh, we simply have to divide the length of the effort arm by the length of the load arm. If we're looking at carnivores versus rodents or something like that, uh, it becomes abundantly clear uh, what carnivores are doing is they're primarily using the temporalis muscle to move that jaw. Uh, rodents, on the other hand, are using primarily the um, masseter muscles. So if we're talking about carnivores, we want to concentrate on what's going on with the temporalis muscle. All right, so here we have our sample polar bear, grizzly bear, and black bear uh, in general. Uh, polar bears are larger than grizzly bears. Grizzly bears are larger than black bears. Um, and we perform the same sort of analyses that we've done before. That is, we use thin plate spline technology to compute uh, the relative warps, these deformations, and then we're investigating that shape. So we've done the procrusty superimposition and all of that. And, and we end up now with this nice principal components, this ordination of these uh, three bear species. Um, and obviously with three species, it's not going to be possible to do any kind of a phylogenetic uh, comparison. Um, but just the same, I think we can learn something from uh, this particular result. And what you notice when you look at this, the, the blue dots, those are the polar bears. Uh, the red dots and the, the red confidence ellipse, those are the uh, black bears. And then the green one, uh, the green uh, dots and uh, ellipse, those are the grizzly bears. So this is simply an ordination. We're not asking the question, how are these things different? We're just asking the question, where is the variation located? Um, and we're now looking at the distribution of these species. And even here, without even trying to force the issue, we see right away that the polar bears are fundamentally different from the black bears and the grizzly bears look at these shape changes, and those are illustrated here. Um, and again, it's the same scenario that we had before. The turquoise represents the starting point um, on these wireframe diagrams, and the dark blue lines represent um, the other extreme, or the positive extreme of each principal component. Uh, let's begin by looking at principal component one. So at the left-hand side of the principal component, we have polar bears. On the right-hand side, we have grizzly bears and black bears. Uh, and you can see, if you look at the polar bears, which are the, the turquoise wireframe, uh, you'll notice there is this fundamental difference. First of all, notice that the dentary bone, if you look at the thickness of the horizontal ramus where the carnassial tooth would be, um, it's much thicker. So it's going to be able to tolerate greater shear forces than something like a black bear or, or a grizzly bear. Uh, the other thing to notice is that notice how much larger that masseteric fossa is and that there is this increased size of the coronoid process. And what that indicates then is that the polar bear is likely able to create or has greater uh, mechanical advantage uh, 
And if there's a corresponding increase in the size of the temporalis muscle, which is what happens, um, the polar bear is going to be able to generate much greater bite forces than will uh, the grizzly bear or the, the black bear. Now, along the second principal component, there is much greater overlap between polar bears, black bears, and grizzly bears. But even there, you can see there are some clear differences between the shapes of these things. But I think the key point that we're interested in here is what's going along principal component one. And there you see this dramatic difference between uh, the potential mechanical advantage of the polar bear and that of the black bear and the grizzly bear. Now, what we can do is we can actually compute what those mechanical advantage values are for the temporalis at the canine. When we do that, what we do is a stepwise regression, multiple regression. And our, our dependent variable is going to be mechanical advantage. And then the independent variable is going to be all of these shape components, so PC1 and PC2. But we also have an estimate of size of the jaw in there. And that is simply going to be um, the actual size of that dentary bone computed as um, the square root of the sum of all of the square distances from the center of each, each dentary bone to each of the landmarks. That's called a centroid size, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, so if you look at um, this table, the first thing you notice at the top of the table is that the overall model is significant. So there is a significant relationship between mechanical advantage of the temporalis muscle and all of these other variables that have been included in there. Now, this is a stepwise multiple regression, so it is building the most parsimonious model possible. The next thing I want to point out at the very bottom of the table, two things. First of all, R square, which is the coefficient of determination, is 0.59. What that means is that roughly 60% of the variation in mechanical advantage of the temporalis muscle is explained by this model. So there's only 40% of the, of the variation in, the, in that mechanical advantage number that we haven't explained. So that's a relatively high um, value right there. The next thing is Mallow's P statistic, which is right next to that. Uh, Mallow's P is equal to 1.9. Um, and that what that indicates is uh, that there is some bias in the model. We have five parameters that we're attempting to estimate here. Our Mallow's P in an unbiased model should be six, and we are below that. So we know that there is some bias inherent in that model. That's fine. We're not using this in any predictive way. We're just trying to understand if there are differences between these, uh, between these animals. And uh, what we can do right away is let's look at these regression coefficients at the bottom and notice what shows up. There is a relationship between grizzly bear and size and the value of the mechanical advantage, and that's positive. So bigger grizzly bears have more mechanical advantage. There is a relationship between polar bears and shape, okay? And that too is significant. So everything that's in this model is significant. Then there is also a significant relationship between grizzly bears and shape along the second principal component. So right away, we know that shape matters in terms of these bears. All right, the next thing uh, let's look at is let's look at the relationship between centroid size and this canonical variant one. That's where most of the difference between polar bears and uh, grizzly bears and brown bears, uh, black bears uh, existed. And what I'd like you to look at now is just sort of a way of summarizing the, the table that you just saw. Notice the difference in the slopes of these. If we do the regression between CV1 and centroid size, you'll notice the slope of that regression line for the polar bears is going to be much steeper than it is for grizzly bears or black bears. And what that tells us is the following. As natural selection favors smaller size in polar bears, the polar bears are going to shift to the right. So they're going to follow a line which is going up to the right. So if, if they get smaller, you follow that cursor, they're going like this, like this, like this, 
And notice here, even at the smallest size of a polar bear, they are still larger than a lot of the grizzly bears. And yet, they have a jaw morphology which is fundamentally different from what you see in the grizzly bears. So selection pressure favoring smaller polar bears does not get them to a place where they can be like grizzly bears. That's an evolutionary cul-de-sac. They're stuck. As selection forces them to be smaller, the polar bears are not going to be just grizzly bear types of animals. They will not have the jaw mechanics that will enable them to exploit the sort of dietary items that are available to grizzly bears or to black bears.